ओके हाय एवरीबॉडी लेट्स स्टार्ट सो इन द लास्ट क्लास व्हाट वर वी टॉकिंग अबाउट वी फर्स्ट डिजाइन डिजाइन द लग्रेंजियन डेरिवेटिव वी डिराइव्ड इट दैट इज टाइम एंड यू इज द वेलोसिटी सो वी स्टार्टेड बाय डिराइविंग द लग्रेंजियन डेरिवेटिव राइट एंड देन वी Uh, talked about the continuity equation which we derived to be plus rho del dot u equal to 0 where rho was the density and u is the velocity and in the continuity equation we said that if the mach number is uh, small it, that means if velocity is a slow compared to speed of sound we can actually consider the flow to be incompressible so we simplified it to del dot u equal to 0 and that's what we are going to use in our course um then we went on to the temperature uh, and concentration equations both of which we derived to be and d concentration by dt equal to d del square c right so like in prompted by one of the questions that was asked i went back home and thought about it and i want to make a correction to the figure i drew that day because i had uh, um, drawn the figure with i drawn the so we had like this water coming in right and we had drawn a delta z here at time equal to t and a uh, volume here at time equal to t plus delta t technically there is nothing stopping us from doing that but numerically if we do this we'll be in trouble numerically we should we it will lead us to the same equations when we are doing derivations but numerically we should only do this this color you can't see no this color is visible only so here we had a z1 and a z2 so like instead of that we'll do a z1 and a z2 so what we will do is we'll move the box slightly but not beyond itself the important reason for this is that the other thing this thing violates what is called the cfl criterion which is important numerically and that's named after kuran friedrich and levy and we are not going to talk numerics in this course but the basic point is that whenever you run a numerical code so what do you do normally you have a partial differential equation you start with an initial condition so you define it at every x so suppose you're solving for velocity you will define velocity at every x y and z and then you'll move it forward with navier stokes right now the delta t you choose if that's too big you're going to run into unstable solutions you're going to run into wrong solutions so it's very very important to choose the delta t very small and this criterion it's just for linear equations it's not a very you know formal uh, criterion for a non linear system where the proof is done or any such thing but the it's kind of a thumb rule we use where we say that uh, in one time step you should not go too far from where you started so basically you have to have the velocity of the flow um uh, the delta t by delta z should be less than 1 by u uh, less than yeah is this coming out dimensionally correct delta z by u so you should use a small delta t so that's the let me just double check that that's the one u delta t is less than delta z correct so this is important because otherwise numerically you will not reach the correct solution in fact in many non linear problems that we have if i use like you know something like u delta t by delta z just less than one i run into trouble i actually have to use it much much less than one so like very often we have to choose very very small time steps in order to get convergence so it's important to remember this and correct this figure in your last class notes and thanks to a question i started 
thinking and I realized that the way I drew it violates the CFL criteria. Okay, so then uh, we talked about the similarity transformation, right? And what was this? What did this bias? Anyone remembers what we did? What? We transferred, uh, we, we basically we transformed the PD into an ODE by defining a new thing called ETA, which we actually found to be X by root T, or it could be any power of this. And we used this and we got an ODE for the concentration, which we could plot like this. Okay, and I'll just come to that in a minute. So we got like C prime, the constant DC, DC by D eta is C zero prime E to the minus eta square by four D or some such thing, correct? We got this kind of equation. So now you see that the concentration depends only on eta. That means if I solve it at one time, and I, so like, let's say at eta equal to, uh, 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 I mean, it's a function only of eta. So suppose I've solved it, at let's say time equal to one. And then like uh, whatever the value was at x equal to one and time equal to one, that same thing will be the answer at x equal to two and time equal to four, right? Uh, I mean, time equal to two and x equal to four. So like I can always, uh, you get it? So like uh, if time was two, then x would be four, then that would be eta equal to one. So whatever value I got for, so I plotted here, here I plotted C. So like if I plot C versus eta, I get only one curve. I get only one curve and this curve represents all these curves. So if I divide it by the right X and T, I can get back the same curve. So that's why this is called similarity. They're all exactly the same curve, but you know, stretched in X differently. So at time equal to one, then x equal to nine would be time equal to three, that kind of thing. So I can get different, different curves for this thing. So this is where we stopped and we wrote the Navier-Stokes equation, but we didn't go too far with it. So today we will go further with it. I'm just writing it in the long form. One by Reynolds del square u. And the reason I wrote it in the long form is so that you see the nonlinearity. In those temperature and concentration equations, the whole thing was still linear in the temperature because it was u dot temperature, right? So whereas this is actually nonlinear because it's u dot grad of itself. So that's what makes it nonlinear. And a lot of very complicated solutions and very complicated behavior comes from this. So like at a rough calculation, like you can count how many universities are there in the world. And in each one, would you say about 30 people, 30 faculty spend their life on fluid uh, Navier-Stokes? Is that a fair estimate? So that's like some zillion people trying to solve the Navier-Stokes. So yeah, if you could solve it completely, you'd go home or something like that. So that's why it's important to know the equation. And one thing we talked about last time was that at high Reynolds number, this is a singular perturbation. Why was that? Why did we call it a singular perturbation? Right, so it's a second order equation and the highest derivative is multiplied by a small number. So somewhere or other, we cannot throw away the highest derivative and where we cannot throw it away, we called it a boundary layer. So like this boundary layer concept should go into your heads and you should use it to think about any kind of problem. Like even in financial markets, there are boundary layers. If you get that straight, you'll see the similarity in these things. So in the Navier-Stokes, we have this very special thing. So any 
vector, it need not even be velocity. Any vector I can, uh, you know, write it as a, a curl free part and a gradient free part. Uh, uh, sorry, del free part. So like uh, basically this is a um, divergence free part and a curl free part. So potential flows are curl free, rotational flows are divergence free. In fact, like for us in incompressible flow, both of them are divergence free because del dot u is zero. So if del dot u r is zero, because del dot u is zero, del dot up also becomes zero. Is this clear? So like, how do we write a curl free part? If something is curl free, I can write it, write it as what? I can write it as a gradient of a scalar, right? So this I will call as grad phi. And this part I can write as curl of something, right? Agreed? Del cross A. So this is what is my velocity. And this part is called the potential flow. And this is the rotational flow. Okay, so suppose A was zero, then we would be in potential flow. And that's a very important class of flows, which we're going to talk about just now. Okay, like what is appealing about it? Like suppose I told you this is zero. And I said, U is grad phi. What appeals to you about this? Or anything appeals to you? What? Phi, yeah, we will make it satisfy Laplace, but why does it appeal to you? Like, why should I write it as grad phi? Why not continue as U? Yes, very good answer. He likes scalar, even I like scalar functions. Yeah, because like three variables you're rolling into one, right? Three unknowns. So who wouldn't want that? So that's basically the idea. Okay, so this is what is going to be my velocity. Okay, so now let us see what this brings us. What writing it like this brings us. So first he said the Laplacian is zero, right? I mean, it's basically satisfies Laplace equation. Let's see why it does that. So in UP, we'll write about UP now. UP is del i of phi, the i component of UP is del i of phi. But then we know UP satisfies del dot u is zero, it's solenoidal. Because it's solenoidal, I have del i of UP i, where i i is repeated means I've done all the, summed it over all the i's, equal to del i del i of phi. But we already know this is zero, right? It's incompressible, right? We already know this is zero from here. So like here, if I wrote it as del dot u r plus del dot u p is zero, I know del dot u r is zero. So del dot u p is also zero, agreed? So then I've got del i del i phi is zero. In other words, del square phi is zero. Okay, so then that is th uh, what we get from that. Now let's look at what it buys us. What does it buy us? So suppose I wrote the equation for UP. In fact, let's not write the full equation. Let's just write the viscous term. One over Reynolds del square U. I can write it as one over Reynolds del square u p plus del square u r. Agreed? And what is del square u p? It's hmm? it's del j del j u p i. What is u p i in terms of phi? Del i phi. And this I'm going to write just as it is. And what is this quantity now? I can take del i here, right? And what is this quantity from here? Hmm? 
I have the gradient of the Laplacian, but the Laplacian itself is zero. So gradient of zero is zero, right? So here I have equal to one over Reynolds del square U R. That is my viscous term. Okay, so this is very, very important to remember that if you have a potential flow, you don't have like any effect due to viscosity. Or put it the other way around, only when you have a curl, viscous forces come into play. So like viscosity acts on a shear or something like that. So in a curl-free flow, if you can have a curl-free flow, you don't have to worry about viscosity. But then like every, every situation has viscosity in it, every real situation. And when it has viscosity in it, there will be curls. Curls will get created. So what does this whole thing buy you? That's the basic question. What do I gain by splitting it into these two? Because I still have to worry about this guy. So here is where the concept of boundary layer becomes very important. So like, suppose I have a aircraft, which is my favorite example. Hey, that day I drew the wing straight. No, today I'm drawing it ulta. That day I made a nice photo, I thought, if I say so myself. Okay. That's not too bad, right? Okay, so now, there is a thin boundary layer along, you know, over the wing. So suppose I cut the wing here and draw the airfoil. There is a very thin boundary layer over which the flow changes in speed from something like the airplane speed, which is what? What's an airplane speed? 0.8 mark, which is what in speed? In kmph or something. Or of that order, that's like a very, uh, I mean, we can, scale it down for incompressible flow and say like hundreds of kilometers per hour, you know, like that. So it's certainly faster than all cars, right? Like even a, yeah. And now there's a thin boundary layer. The boundary layer is typically like this thin, a few millimeters to a centimeter. So like if I have a wing that big and I have a one little thing, in that the velocity goes from, this is the airfoil now, in this place, the velocity goes from zero, no slip at the wall, where I'm pretending that the plane is stationary and the flow is going past it. I'm in the frame of reference of the plane. The velocity is zero at the wall and like hundreds of kilometers per hour, just one little bit away. So clearly like this place is very rotational because like viscosity is acting over there. But outside, viscosity doesn't really act. And outside, I can think of it as a potential flow. Okay, so now the nice thing about this thing is that all the lift, even when I'm throwing a cricket ball, for example, all the lift is typically coming from the potential part. All the drag is coming from the viscous part. So the lift actually like the flow gets modified quite a bit beyond this. So I can't draw the exact thing for the plane, but I can draw the exact thing for a cylinder. So let me go back to that end of the board and draw it for a cylinder. So the nice thing about potential flow is you can get exact solutions for many, many bodies. So for example, for a cylinder, I take a cylinder and I rotate it. So this cylinder is rotating at some rotation rate and there is flow coming at this from at some velocity u. So what's a streamline? It's basically a line which uh, is tangential to the velocity vector at every place. So it tells you how the flow is going. So if I draw the streamlines around this rotating cylinder, This is what it looks like. So these are directly from the potential flow. So do you notice any difference in the top and the bottom? Yes, what? The lines are further apart. If the lines are further, I made it exaggerated, but you can look at the real photo. 
If I make it further apart, that means the flow is decelerating. So anywhere where streamlines, you know, are not very close to each other, there's a given amount of flow between this streamline and this streamline. So that means it's slower and anywhere where they come closer together, it means the flow is accelerating. So this you can recognize. Okay, and if I go pretty far from the cylinder, like, you know, like suppose this is R. If I go to 2R, there also I'll see more than 10% change because of the existence of the cylinder. And 3R, it, it scales like 1 over R cube. So it, it falls off, but if I can go quite a distance and I'll see that the flow is modified due to the presence of the cylinder. So like if I give a cricket ball here, then at this place, the air will know the difference. And that's not because of viscosity, it's totally inviscid. It's a totally inviscid phenomenon because of the potential part. And so like how it's going to turn, what is going to happen, the Magnus lift, everything about the cricket ball I can get from the potential flow, except whatever happens at the seam. So seam is not counted. You know, cricket ball has a seam, right? So that is very viscous, like because you're actually meddling with the boundary layer. The way you're directing the seam, like the way you're orienting the seam can make a big difference to how the boundary layer behaves. But we are not talking boundary layer here, we are talking the rest of it. So potential flow is very important to understand how a flow gets modified by a given shape. And uh, like in other places also, inviscid flows are important. For example, in the ocean, there are many situations where you don't care about the rotational part. You may write, I mean, there it's different because you're on a rotating earth. So that effect will come in, but uh, you don't care about this part, the viscous part. So this is the reason we often split it into two and study. And suppose now I told you that the flow is potential. I've given you that the flow is potential. Then let's write down that equation. I can write down del u by del t plus u dot grad u equal to minus grad p, correct? And this is like, let's say a potential flow. So the u itself is up, there is no ur. Uh, I've non-dimensionalized it. That, I mean, I wrote it like this with the one over Reynolds, right? That's why I took away the density. Okay, so this is why I've written it like this. Now, what can I do? I know it's potential. So this one I can write as del by del t of del i phi. Hmm? And this one, what can I do with it? Let's play with that here. So I've got u dot grad u, which is u j del j u i. Okay, now we know that this flow doesn't have vorticity because I told you it's potential. All the vorticity part comes here. Curl of this goes to zero, right? It's a curl free part. So we know that the vorticity is zero in this flow. If I know the vorticity is zero, what is vorticity? Del cross u. So omega, the vorticity is del cross u, agree? Now del cross u is zero means del u, del i u j minus del j u i is zero. Agree or disagree? Agree. So del i u j minus del j u i is zero. I just replace it here. This del j u i, I'm going to write it as u j u j del i u j. And this I can immediately take the u inside, u j del i u j. And I can write it as del i of u square by two because uj uj becomes mod of u square. No? Del, so u del u. I take the u inside. Del of u square. Del of u square ka half is this. Got it? Okay, so I've written it like this. And so I've written my this part equal to minus del i p or I can write plus del i p equal to zero. 
So I take the del i out, del i, del phi by del t plus u square by two plus p equal to zero. What have we shown? Bernoulli. What? Bernoulli equation. You can also prove it in viscous flows along streamlines, but that's not part of this course. We can't do all that. So we've shown Bernoulli equation because if del i of something is zero, then that thing is a constant. So that's all we've shown. Okay, so for potential flow, it immediately satisfies Bernoulli. Now, in inviscid flow, let's do an example. Correct, but in a potential flow, it will hold everywhere. It will hold everywhere because curl is zero. We didn't make any assumption. We didn't say streamline, perpendicular, nothing. It holds everywhere if the flow is potential. So outside the boundary layer, it will hold. You can apply it happily outside the boundary layer. You can add gravity, you can do whatever you like. But in a vertical flow, you have to move along streamlines. It will not work perpendicular to streamlines. Okay? And that we're not proving here. So we're going to do an example with an inviscid flow where we're not going to worry about, uh, we're not going to worry about um, um, this thing. We're not going to worry whether it's potential or not, okay? So let's write that down. Here is the inviscid equation. In fact, I could even write the viscous term, but it won't come in this problem. So what I've got is a big vessel of some liquid, let's say water. And then I'm going to rotate this whole vessel at a rotation rate, at some rota constant rate omega. What happens? Hmm? Fluid gets deformed. Yeah, this one will make something like this. Okay, unless it's in turbulent flow, which it better be if it's a washing machine, unless it's in turbulent flow, it's going to be in solid body rotation. Okay, so now let's consider this, it's that it's in that case where there is solid body rotation. And if it's in solid body rotation, like the distance between two particles never changes. So there is no shear. If there is no shear, the viscous term will anyway not play a role. So we're doing fine by taking inviscid. So let me call this as Z0. This height as Z0 where the base of the parabolic thing is. I'm saying parabolic, but we'll show it soon. And this let's call as a height above the baseline. And H is a function of R. H is a function of R where R is the radius and it goes up to cap R. Agreed? Can we solve this problem using this? Is there any term I can throw away? It's a steady flow. That means I can throw away the time derivative. And because it's in solid body rotation, which component of velocity is the only one which survives? The theta, the azimuthal one. Only that one survives. So then like the u dot grad u in cylindrical coordinates, I can write. And this one we said went to zero because of our problem. And the u dot grad u is going to be minus u theta square by r. That's just from the equation. It's just a way of writing u dot grad u in the, these coordinates and there's only u theta equal to minus del p by del r. We're writing the r balance equation. We're writing the equation in r. Okay, and what is u theta? Solid body rotation, anyone? 
it's r omega so u theta square so minus minus i'll remove u theta square is r omega square by r so i've thrown away one now r omega square is del p by del r no minus anymore and i get p is equal to like p at z0 plus r square omega square by 2 so basically i have got this now if i take the balance in that direction nothing is moving in that direction right so it's all hydrostatics can i write hydrostatic pressure anyway so the hydrostatic pressure pressure will be p0 plus rho g h okay so now what do i have I have H as a function of R. H is equal to what now? Wait, wait. I shouldn't have written the row because it's I've, I've non-dimensionalized it. But let me write back the row everywhere to make it correct. One by row, one by row. And this is what row P, right? P by row, right? Is it correct now? It's correct now. So now we can equate this and this. And I can write H is equal to R square. And there will be a row here also, right? This is P by row, so I have to write the row times that. So I'll get H is equal to R square omega square by 2G. So I get my parabolic shape for H. So this is a nice example where viscosity didn't come in. And uh, the nice thing it buys us is that it tells us that if, you know, gravity is very, very, very big, then there'll be no parabola. It's actually going to just be flat because gravity hates anybody climbing, right? So like you get all those answers from here. So you can think like it, it's a kind of beginning to start thinking about a rotating earth, like what it buys you. So this is just an example we've solved here. And now, now let's talk about vorticity. Any questions so far? Any questions in potential flow or anything? You want me to go over it again, it's OK. Why are you considering that to be potential? Hmm? Why are we considering that? It so happens to be a potential flow. It so happens that all the vorticity gets you know, uh, uh, concentrated in a thin layer. In many situations, it need not always be the case. Okay. So like, you know, for example, in turbulence, like suppose I have a cloud, everywhere it's turbulent and everywhere it's rotational. Yes. So it's not as if the standard case is potential, no way. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, typically when bodies are moving through fluid, the fluid is quiescent and you're asking how far did this go? So in order to keep a fluid in turbulence, you need energy. So if nobody is supplying the energy, a fluid will return to a quiescent state, right? It's not going to do anything. So those are the conditions in which typically the flow is potential outside a thin boundary layer at high Reynolds, at very high Reynolds numbers. Even there, it's not always true. I'm glad you brought up this point because, for example, in this cylinder, right, at high Reynolds number, the boundary layer will be thin here. Yes, but there'll be a big wake. There'll be a huge wake which has turbulent flow in it. And so this potential flow stuff is not correct. You'll have to consider a big body like that. When does potential flow work? When you have a more streamlined body and you're avoiding what is called massive separation. So what is massive separation? So like we'll go back to the aircraft because that gives the idea 
So here I've made sure that the flow doesn't, that the flow streamlines, they leave parallel to the trailing edge. I've made sure by design that, you know, this is how it is. But suppose like, you know, the pilot had to suddenly nose up a lot. So then they nose up a lot. The airfoil goes like this, right? And then we didn't design it for that, right? We didn't design it to be nosed up by some 15 degrees or something. It was never supposed to go away from two or three degrees. Then what happens is the streamlines come and they just leave the surface. They just leave the surface and you get reverse flow here. You get like some small flow, very small velocity and it's in the negative direction. So you actually get reverse flow here. So this is called massive separation. So whenever there is massive separation, potential flow theory will not work. And in a ball, by definition, there's massive separation. Like it'll just leave like that. You cannot have the streamlines coming back. So any body which is you know, going through this sharp turn in its geometry, you will get massive separation. And in an aircraft, this can actually mean that the whole plane will fall down because, because why? Yeah, yeah, the, you've designed the lift. I mean, you need the whole circulation around that aircraft to generate the lift. And now, like, so if you're good, you, you fall down a bit, but then if you rectify yourself, you're okay. So that is what's going to happen. A solid body, which is, you know, more gentle, where there's no separation moving in a fluid. Otherwise, I can take the separated region also as part of the body. If I know all the region where the viscosity is coming in, I can have an effective body, which is that shape, and then I can solve potential flow around that. It will be applicable for shaping drops. It's only applicable at pretty high Reynolds numbers. A raindrop, yes, like some big raindrops can be at several thousands. And yeah, like something like this could be applicable, except that a raindrop is not spherical. When it becomes really large, like gravity starts winning. So in fact, like, I mean, some of our calculations showed that it's got a basket-like shape, not teardrop shape. Oh, there are online questions. Can you tell me? Inertia, as in the motion of fluid lagging behind the force. Fluid lagging behind the force? I don't understand the question. Can you ask them to explain? Uh, yeah, can you, uh, who, whoever asked this question about the fluid inertia, can you uh, explain your questions more? I couldn't understand your question. And any other? Does liquid mirror, mirror telescope work at this rate? A liquid? Mirror telescope. I have no idea. Huh. Okay. The next question is, uh, from this proof of parabolic path, hmm. is it possible to generalize or compare with GR conditions, X accretion disk around the black holes? No. In one word, no. Because like we've not considered, you know, so many forces which are there. And like, it need not even be classical in that context. Uh, so in massive separation, the created vacuum hmm. uh, would pull the thing up again to restore the potential flow. Okay, okay, okay. Let me clarify. Massive separation does not mean vacuum. It does not mean vacuum. There's still fluid everywhere. It's incompressible. It's just, it's moving in very, very slow way around here. So it's moving very, very slow. That's all is happening. In fact, like, you know, sometimes there can be a higher pressure here than here, it's accelerating there. So massive separation doesn't mean vacuum. It just means that streamlines which were attached to the wall or close to the wall went away. So something else happened there. So you, you got an effective body which looks like this. And that body doesn't lift. That's the interesting thing. So, I mean, since we're talking all of this, I can just give you a slight aside. Uh, they uh, design uh, fighter aircraft to do a lot of these things. 
So for passenger aircraft, the thing is very easy. Like you need to go in a steady flight and most of the time you're in a steady flight and okay, you have to deal with takeoff and landing, that's all. And then you go like this. But when you're in a fighter aircraft, you might have to do very rapid maneuvers. You might have to go upside down or do, you know, uh, these cartwheel type motions when obviously you'll be losing lift. So you'll be trained to deal with that. Like fighter pilots have to be trained to deal with that. So even if they're losing lift and they're falling, they can recover and go back. So that is like, you leave everything on the person, not in the design. So like that is how those are made. And uh, in fact, they deliberately made unstable. They deliberately made unstable. So these uh, aircraft, for example, there is the um, center of gravity acting downwards and the center of pressure acting upwards. Okay, so the minute this becomes like that, the center of pressure is behind the center of gravity and it produces a torque like this. So it brings it back. So the minute there is an excess of anything, like the center of pressure be being behind makes it stable. So it brings it back. Whereas in the fighter aircraft, they'll put it here. They make it deliberately unstable because you don't want it to keep returning to its position when this guy is trying to do something. So it has to aid whatever he's trying to do, he or she is trying to do. So that is something which came up. So we're talking about that. Okay, so shall we move on to what is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we move a bucket of water, mm. we cannot determine the state of the fluid or velocity of the particles accurately mm. going to inertia that resists its motion. Wait, wait, let me read the full question. So first they said, uh, when, yeah, where's the first question? The first part, this. It says, does uh, what? How do we take care of inertia? In As in the motion of the fluid lagging behind the force, okay. And uh, when we move a bucket of water, we cannot determine the state of the fluid or velocity of the particles accurately owing to inertia that resists its motion. Okay, okay. So like, just think of it this way. Like if the fluid is, um, if, if you're starting the bucket, then in the initial time, you don't know what's happening. It will take, inertia will ensure that it takes some time to reach solid body rotation. So you're, you're keeping the bucket on a rotating table, you're rotating the table and uh, the, the water is going to say, okay, like I don't like this and take some time to reach the final state. So the inertia will take some time to reach the steady state and that's all. Once it's reached the steady state, so long as it's laminar, if it is turbulent, all bets are off. So long as it's laminar, the solution will hold and you can get a parabola. So think of this as a steady state solution, not as the initial solution, yeah, transient. Other questions? What determines the thickness of the boundary layer? Okay, so uh, the thickness of the boundary layer depends on the geometry and on the Reynolds number. Effectively, those two things will determine the thickness of the boundary layer. So in fact, like you could take, where is the full Navier-Stokes equation? Let's rub this out and write that. Okay, you could take this. So let's take a flat plate and there is velocity u, okay? And at this place, it'll come to a standstill because the plate is stationary and this is the leading edge, x equal to zero. And it goes on with x, right? I'm not going to do the full derivation for you because that will deviate from everything, but just to answer your question. So the boundary layer is like this. I know it's thin because the Reynolds is high. I know it's thin, so I know that outside the boundary layer, the flow is at U. Okay, it's only that that outside becomes further and further away. It becomes fatter and fatter as you go down. 
and you know it grows because like this at first this layer alone is brought to rest but then viscosity brings that slows down the next layer slows down the next layer so as you go downstream the boundary layer grows this much you know and now what you can do is because it's thin i take this term del square u and i'll write it's approximately and this is x this is y and this is two dimensional so del square u is actually del square u by del x square plus del square u by del y square and i see it's growing so slowly in x that you know derivatives in x are very small whereas in y wait it's gone all the way from 0 to some very big u over some small distance delta so this term can be thrown away in favor of that term in comparison to that term and i'll replace it like this i'll put this back there and on a flat plate grad p is 0 i'm talking steady state what does this look like to you diffusion equation but with a nonlinear term and now you can use the same idea that i told you yesterday the similarity transformation in the last class and you can write something in terms of eta so you try to make this into an ode it's a pde but like already you threw away one term now you try to make it into an ode and you can get like a very easy solution so you will see that the and and that you can write it in terms of eta and you get i'll leave it as a homework to you you get this famous by 2 or the constant could vary depending on the eta you chose and where f prime is u so you get a nice third order differential equation an ordinary differential equation which describes the velocity profile in the boundary layer and you will also get that the thickness of the boundary layer goes as there's a proportionality constant so x divided by reynolds number if the reynolds number is based on delta okay so you can actually derive this thing and this is called the blasius equation because it's all 2d nothing is changing in the other direction so d by dz of everything is zero no this is the reynolds based on delta so it's it's a square root of the other reynolds so shall we uh, go on to vorticity yeah so like if they can hear me uh, if you write the reynolds as x u by nu then it will vary as the square root but i wrote my reynolds my reynolds is delta u by nu which is like the square so this will call as rex which is proportional to root rex so it's just i told you on the first day that i can choose the reynolds the way i like right so here is an example where their choice is the square of my choice times a constant yeah yeah it's kind of like that that also goes like a square root but for a completely different reason this is because the boundary layer thickness grows like that and that is because the way the distribution goes at the center so yeah we're not going to talk about that but this is how it is more questions 
Okay, let's move on to vorticity. Write down a bit about the vorticity and then go for a five minute break. So we're going to derive, or we're not going to derive it, we're just going to write it down. You can derive it at home for fun. The vorticity equation. And the vorticity omega is del cross u. We're going to derive the, write down the equation for that. And the reason we're doing this is the following. We just now spoke about this class of situations where potential flow comes in. But we also said that in turbulence, it never does. So turbulence, you can think of as a bunch of vorticity. We talked on the first day about how there are many different solutions, right? Of the Navier-Stokes, different, different periodic solutions for different situations. So we actually drew a channel. Hey, by the way, I'm not solving the channel flow equation. Channel flow, pipe flow under laminar conditions is homework for you to derive the parabolic velocity profile. Okay, if you can't get it, then you can ask one of the TAs to help you. But do try this out if you haven't done so. So we said in turbulence, let's consider a turbulent channel. We said that at every x, y, and z, there is a u. So u has a value at every x, y, and z and time. And the whole picture inside this channel in a periodic solution will come back to the same thing after a great time. So there are different levels of periodic solutions in turbulence and real turbulence moves close to these solutions. And these solutions are highly vertical. That means the vorticity is pretty high and the vort it's always, uh, there's vorticity everywhere in the flow, not just in a special boundary layer. Turbulence means there's vorticity everywhere. And these vorticity, the patches of vorticity are organized. So it's not as if vorticity is like white noise. It's usually organized. Okay, so one common way they organized is as a sheet or as a tube. And a vertical region is a region which is rotating, roughly speaking. So, like if there's a sheet like this with vorticity in the middle, I mean with a velocity jump in the middle, that would be a vortex sheet. So, like if I have a velocity profile like this, a u big and a u small. And this is some thickness delta over which the u is going from u big to u small, except that typically it will vary smoothly. So instead of three straight lines, I can make a tan hyperbolic. So this thing, if delta is small, is called a vortex sheet. So like if you have any fast moving fluid and then a slow moving fluid below it, that's a vortex sheet. And across a vortex sheet, there is a jump in velocity. So what is vorticity here? Can somebody help me with the uh, profile of vorticity? Suppose I had only this portion. What is del cross u? Say that louder, whoever. Huh? Yaha pe, I'm asking about here. Zero, right? So like vorticity is del cross ub, but ub is a constant, so it's zero over here. Up there, u small, sorry. Up there, zero. Here? Not zero, approximately how much? Huh? UB, so vorticity is approximately UB minus US by delta. It would be exactly UB minus US by delta if I had three straight lines. But because it's a tan hyperbolic, I might get a factor which is close to one. So vorticity is 
and the vorticity profile therefore so let's draw the vorticity profile here it will be zero zero and something like this and where this size is ub minus us by delta okay so this is how the vorticity goes i could keep thinning down the sheet i could keep thinning it down thinning it down thinning it down till delta approaches zero and what will happen to the vorticity yeah the vorticity will diverge yeah it will become like a delta function the vorticity will diverge so a very thin sheet where the net circulation so circulation in this case and i'll derive it i'll i'll uh, after the break i'll write circulation in a better way for you but circulation here is gamma it's called by a quantity gamma it's going to be in this case like i can call it as delta u okay like i i think there is a better word for this than circulation i'll tell you after the break so then i can call it as delta u so there'll be a jump of size delta u which is omega times delta effectively so omega is diverging delta is going to zero and the uh, the let's call it the velocity jump because i'm going to derive the circulation for you properly delta u so every time there is a velocity jump that becomes a vortex sheet so this this is one way in which vortices vortices can be organized uh, there is another way in which they can be organized which is like tubes tube like so this is a caricature okay in turbulence everywhere there is vorticity but suddenly there will be peaks in vorticity which are arranged in roughly tube like fashion or roughly sheet like fashion it's not exact what i'm telling you but you get a tube of vorticity so imagine that there is a tube in solid body rotation and outside it nothing okay so vorticity can be organized here so here i would get a vorticity profile like this where it's some big number because it's in solid body rotation typically it's not in solid body rotation but it adopts a gaussian profile and that we call a lambosian vortex so you get all these different things and uh, uh, it's important to study it if you want to understand turbulence so after the break we'll take it up in a little more detail okay welcome back we're going to write down the vorticity equation and how do we do that we said that vorticity is del cross u right so now we will do just the curl of the whole navier stokes equation what we are going to do is the curl of the whole thing and i am going to write down the equation for you which you can go home and derive for yourself just by taking the curl it's not at all hard to do that so we are going to get do omega by dot t plus u dot grad omega what's going to happen to the pressure term that will go to zero so that's the nice thing about the vorticity equation we don't have to solve for the pressure it's self consistent equal to um omega dot grad u plus 1 over reynolds del square omega so this is now the vorticity equation because this extra term comes from when you take the curl of this complicated term so you can do this at home and you'll get this okay so this is a very nice way to think about the flow hmm because we said that flow turbulence is organized into 
vortices, which are tube-like, sheet-like, things like that. We can ask about those things. In fact, when you have like a big flow, like a channel flow, or let's say in a washing machine, suppose you zoom in, zoom in, zoom in to the small scales. The vortices at that scale doesn't, doesn't, they don't know like which way the whole thing is rotating or which way the whole flow is flowing. They could be going with equal probability backwards or forwards relative to the mean. So you see a lot of isotropic behavior. And in that regime, you can think of turbulence as something like a pasta bowl, a big bowl of pasta where we've got these long, you know, vertical things of all shapes and sizes. It's not going to be just one kind of pasta. And normally in pasta bowl, like all the pastas sitting there in complicated ways, it could be knotted up, it could be something. But in addition, these things are rotating furiously. All the pastas are rotating furiously. And because they're rotating furiously, they'll make the others move. They'll induce a velocity on the others. Then they're going to be born, they're going to die. Things like that keep happening. Like the same vortices don't last forever. After a while, they dissipate and new ones get born. They get knotted. Siddhartha is going to show you what happens when it's knotted. They get knotted. Like anything very long and mixed up is going to get into knots, right? And those knots then unknot by reconnections. So lots of such things keep happening in turbulence. Sorry? Omega equal to del cross u, yes. That's all. So what I've done is I've taken the curl of the Navier-Stokes, pressure term went away. And like this term, for example, it's obvious for you, right? It's obvious that it becomes del, and this term also is obvious. This term is slightly unobvious, it becomes two terms, that's all. So that's what is my vorticity equation in 3D. So if I follow vorticity, this is what happens. And you can see that there is a viscous term which can kill off vorticity. It can slowly diffuse out vorticity. So like, we'll see what happens to this. So, yes. Mm. Then vorticity also occurs in laminar, laminar flow, right? Correct. Because of no slip condition. Correct. Correct. So in the channel flow, where the velocity profile is parabolic, there is a vorticity across all of it. It's only zero at the center because the gradient is zero. So vorticity is just du by dy. And u is one minus y square, right? If this is the center line and this is y and this is one, u is one minus y square. So du by dy is minus two y. Because so there's a vorticity which is maximum at the two walls and zero at the center. So yes, lamina flow also has vorticity. Lamina flow does not mean potential flow. In fact, this thing that I wrote down for the boundary layer, the blushes boundary layer is laminar. It's a laminar boundary layer. Turbulent boundary layer is very different. I couldn't be neglecting one derivative or I couldn't be doing all those assumptions that I'm doing. Okay? And I, I couldn't first stay, say that the flow is completely steady. There's no way it's steady in a turbulence. Okay? Okay, so this is a very nice term, omega dot grad u. It's called the vortex stretching term. Vortex stretching. Okay, so let's see how it works. So suppose I have a flow with I mean, I have a vortex tube. So I have a flow where there's one thing rotating like a solid body and nothing else rotating in the nearby vicinity, nothing else much happening in the nearby vicinity. And I've got, let's say a U going that way and a U going this way. Let's say this is how my U goes. So in this line, which way is grad U? 
perpendicular. Gradius is in this direction, right? There's a minus u here and a plus u here. So there is a gradient of u in that direction. And the omega is also in that direction. So the omega is in that direction, the gradius is in that direction. The omega is in that direction because the uh, rotation is in the plane perpendicular to the omega. So the rotation is in this plane, the omega is pointing that way. And let's say there is a outside flow which is pointing like this. It's stretching the vortex, right? So there is an omega dot gradu because gradu is in that direction. It's stretching the vortex. So that's what this vortex stretching term does. And when that happens, it produces vorticity because you, you saw that when the thickness goes down, the vorticity goes up, right? So that's what is happening. The whole uh, circumference is going down and the vorticity is going up. So that's why this is called the vortex stretching term. What, and, and in turbulence, vortex stretching is a very important thing, which Samridhi will repeatedly refer to, like, you know, when he talks about turbulent cascade, like things, energy going from big scales to small scales. You can just do that by stretching. You don't have to take the big scale and create two short, small scales. You can just do that by stretching. And you can also do the reverse, which is fattening. And you can ask Shamridhi why stretching happens more than fattening. You, you could do the reverse by having, you know, flow coming in like this and going out like that. That also happens, but not as frequently. In fact, they're not. They're not. So yeah, that's why you should attend next week's lectures. In fact, they're not. Okay, so this is vortex stretching. And yes, what? Sorry? What would be the gradu in this case? The gradu. So like, uh, basically, uh, so u is now in the v direction, right? So suppose I call this as y. And I'm just, let, let's plot something like the velocity here. The v will be like in this direction here and that direction there. So the velocity is, if I plot it as a function of y, the velocity in the v direction is going from negative to positive. Agreed? So it's going through a zero here, around here, and it's going from negative to positive. So if I want to write the gradu tensor, the gradu tensor, it will be like zero, 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 and some positive value here, just the slope of this. If this is the slope, it will be that. Got it? That's the gradu tensor. <clears throat> okay. In two dimensions, can you think of what's happening in two dimensions to this equation? Hmm? There'll be only exactly in two dimensions, you can have only omega z. Because if all the flow is in this direction, and I'm taking the curl, all the flow is in this plane, so there's U's and V's, and I'm taking the curl of it, all curls will be in that direction. So omega becomes a scalar. Uh, but it's a field, it's a scalar field. One more term, uh, this one is tilting, other one is tilting. That one also does tilting. That is not there in incompressible flow. This is incompressible, so that won't come. <clears throat> what am I writing here? R, T, it's T, R. Okay, so in 2D, we decided that the omega is a, like a scalar field all in this direction. What, I mean, what happens to that equation? Any immediate simplification you can see in 2D? <clears throat> Hmm? The z component? There's no z component of the velocity. The velocities are all in two dimensions. So imagine a soap film. Why? They are orthogonal to each other. Which one is zero? U dot grad omega may not be zero. Omega dot grad u will be zero. 
because omega is all in the z direction and gradu is all in the plane. So omega dot gradu is zero. Okay, grad omega can be in the plane because it's a field. So grad omega need not, this need not be zero. This need not be zero. So that goes away in 2D. So we're left with this very simple equation. D omega by dt is equal to one by Reynolds del square omega. Okay. So suppose the vortex tube is running somewhere in the flow and I run with the vortex tube. So there's a vortex tube which is facing that way in 2D. I go, I walk with it. So I'm in the Lagrangian frame of the vortex. What is happening to the vortex? It's just diffusing. It's slowly diffusing out. So basically <clears throat> it's obeying the heat equation. That's all is happening. So if I go with this vortex and let's say at time equal to zero, my vorticity profile was like that. Then this Laplacian is just diffusing it out. So like with time, it's going to become like this and like this and so on. So slowly it's diffusing out due to viscosity and nothing else is happening to it in 2D. So that's what happens when you follow a vortex in 2D. And uh, what's the other thing I wanted to tell about this? Yeah, this is when I'm moving with the vortex, when I'm going wherever the vortex goes. So, uh, Ritwik, Rajarshi, are you guys showing the soap film experiment? Okay, that will be great. Like, then they can see like what it's like in 2D. So this is what happens in two dimensions. So nothing much interesting happens in two dimensions. So two dimensional turbulence is a completely different creature from three dimensional turbulence because you're missing the vortex stretching term. So like vortex mergers and things like that are much more common in two dimensions. Okay, so now let's go to another thing. We've done vortex stretching. Let's go back to the 3D equation and do another thing. We're now going to define the thing called circulation. So like suppose this thing is like a top hat profile of omega. Within a radius r, it's all a constant omega, solid body rotation like. It's a constant omega. And so like uh, the total circulation inside this is defined as omega dot dA integrated over the area. And this is a circular shape, a circular tube. So this circulation is, if I k give this vortex thickness as delta, it's going to be delta pi delta square times <clears throat> omega, which is just a constant. And this is going to be my circulation. Now, I don't want you to confuse any circular motion with that being that part of the flow being vertical. The reason is as follows. So from Gauss's theorem, what does this tell me? For any vector, this is equal to u dot dl, right? If I'm walking along a closed path. And I can choose any closed path which contains the vortex. So now let's think in 2D, we've got the vortex here of dia delta and circulation gamma. If I draw a circle here, which is of radius r, what will the velocity here be? Yeah, so basically I have to have, I have to have u at r times two pi r is equal to, which we wrote down as pi delta square omega, omega zero, let's call it, which was the height of the omega. So like u at a given radius, but in which direction it is? It's in the theta direction, right? U theta. So the important part is that this region alone is vertical. 
This region is what we call irrotational. There's no omega there. But because the omega is contained inside that, I can draw any closed path, bigger and bigger and bigger closed path. I'll still get some fluid going around in circles. Except that the amount going around in circles is going to have slower and slower velocity as I go out. So the flow around any such vortex is, it effectively goes out to infinity, this circular motion. Is this clear? The center is not irrotational. This is rotational. Basically here, the omega is not equal to zero. But everywhere here, the omega is equal to zero. Everywhere here, it's equal to zero, but I'm sitting here, I'm going in this big circle. I'm in a region which has no vorticity, but still I'm going in a closed path around a vortex. Because that vortex is there, it's making me go in a closed path. That's just kinematics. In, it'll happen for any vector, it need not even be velocity. Curl of any vector obeys the Gauss's law. So that is what it's coming out of, yes? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, cyclones are like a very good example of a vortex. Okay, okay. No, the point is that's a completely different thing which is not part of this class, but let's discuss it since you brought it up. Now the point is that in a rotating earth, Whenever something is rotating, you have effectively everything aligns itself along the, um, uh, there are no changes along the direction of the rotation axis. Okay, so it becomes like a 2D flow. So everything becomes 2Dized. So that follows from the Taylor Proudman theorem. Okay, so that is for a rotating Earth. It's not something we're going to derive now or you can read about this. Theorem. Okay, and you can make a simple example of it. You can make it in your house also if you have a rotating table. So take a bucket of water and stick a small stone in it at the base, inside the bucket. Take a little thing and just stick it at the bottom, not in the center because it's no fun. Then rotate the whole bucket. You'll see a tornado here. You'll see a long tornado here. Okay, and you can increase the size of the water till there you'll still see the tornado rising all the way up. Okay, it's rising because there's no variation in this direction. Because of strong rotation, variations in this direction get suppressed. Yes. Correct, in the atmosphere, it's a more complicated thing, but the basic funda is this. Basic funda that there's no difference, it's rising all the way to the sky, is Taylor Prudman. It doesn't mean it's not dying away. Okay, like this tornado is this thick, right? Forget the stone, wala. Like, like in the real earth, let's say a tornado has this radius. After some time, its strength will come down and its radius will widen. That will happen, but the viscous, viscous effects are very slow because the Reynolds number there is very high. So if you want to see like this term doing this, the time at which that happens will be very, very late. You get that? Because the Reynolds aside, this term is very small. Yes. Okay, so let us do one more thing. So this is now my circulation, agreed? Now, 
in inviscid flow, suppose viscosity is not there and you're living in two dimensions, then what happens to this equation? Yeah, so basically d omega by dt is zero. So wherever uh, the, uh, like if you follow the vortex, nothing is going to happen to it. It's going to stay exactly the same wherever it is. So it's vorticity will not diffuse. Nothing will change, whatever vorticity it started with. It's going to go where it likes, but it will continue to rotate in the same way. So this is in 2D. Let's see what happens in 3D. In 3D, I want to ask what happens to omega dot dA, that integral. If I had a bunch of concentrated vorticity, what happens to this thing, namely the circulation? Okay, so I'm going to ask d gamma by dt is equal to what? Sorry, capital D. And so I'll write d gamma by dt is d by dt of integral u dot dl. I'll now write it in terms of u dot dl, okay? Of any particular circle u, cir circular thing, closed curve u that I draw is equal to this. And I can take the d by dt inside. I'll get du by dt dot dl plus u dot d by dt of dl. Hmm? And if it's an inviscid flow, what is du by dt? It's given for me by the Navier-Stokes, right? It's minus grad P, right? I can write that. Okay, so like what I'd suggest is I'm doing everything in shorthand. You can do it in longhand and try it out. It'll be exactly right. So in other words, like, you know, you just try it at home. So like, I'm sitting at this place and I could go around to integrate the U instead of which I'm doing D by DL of that thing. So like I can take the D by DT inside and do it for the U and do it for the L. So like it's, there's nothing wrong in interchanging those two. Like it has to be closed, continuous, all those things. So, so long as it's smooth enough, there's absolutely nothing wrong in taking it inside, but you have to do it carefully because I'm pretending D by DT is one object, but it has a U dot grad and everything in it. So just do it carefully and convince yourself. Okay, so you can actually take it inside. And DU by DT is minus grad P dot DL plus D by DT of DL is DU, right? I've taken an L a distance and I'm looking at it after some time. And if I expand it out like we did the other day, T plus delta T minus T, blah, blah, blah. You can show that this is DU. Okay, so how much is the first term? It's grad P dot DL. How much is that? I start here and let's say I'm going in a circular path and I've come back here because I've closed my integral. So I'm doing grad P, grad P, grad P and then coming back here. Zero, right? Any gradient integrated on a closed path has to be zero. It's not, it doesn't have a curl, so it has to be zero. And what is u dot du on a closed path? It's u squared by two, um, whatever, on a closed path. So when I, when I come back to the same place, it's again zero. 
So this is equal to zero. Both of them are zero. What have we shown? Circulation is a constant when we walk along with the circulation. So when we're going in its frame of reference, in the Lagrangian thing, in the Lagrangian frame of reference of the circulation, circulation is a constant. What's the assumption we made here? Inviscid. Did we make an assumption of 2D? No, we did not. It's in 3D. So in 3D inviscid flow, this is valid and it's called the Kelvin's circulation theorem. So all of this stuff is in all the standard books. Kelvin circulation theorem. Yeah, because du by dt itself is grad p. Do u by dot t plus u dot grad is grad p. So I got rid of it because p is a gradient. I mean, it's a gradient term which I integrated it out to zero. So it's nonlinear, it's 3D, it's messy, it's turbulent, it's whatever you like. But d gamma by dt, d capital gamma by dt is zero. So long as there's no viscous diffusion. Yes. That is just this U. So imagine this flow, and I'm going around in this circular path. I could go in any path I like, but I have to take the U in that direction, U dot DL. Uh, uh. Correct. So what's the U? That U is the U at any place. So like I'm walking along, so like this thing works when, let me first choose a closed path. So let me choose a closed path in 3D, okay? Any closed path. I've chosen that. So like the U dot grad U will be at any point in that closed path. Ah, in order to calculate gamma first, I'll have to draw some plane through that closed path. And then I have to see how much vorticity is cutting. So I do integral of omega dA, I'll get the gamma. But I don't even need to know that gamma. All I need to know is whatever used to be the gamma inside that closed path, could also be written as integral u dot dl. The total thing could be written as u dot dl. And that u was everywhere ka u. So like suppose the velocity here is there, but I'm going in the closed path in this direction. So I take the component of u in that direction. I dot it with dl and I keep dotting it with dl and I walk along. So it's not along a streamline. Streamlines could be going any which way, doesn't matter but I'm dotting it along my closed path, which I've selected. I don't understand which use outside the integral. D, D, D gamma by DT. So like what I'm doing here is I'm moving with my closed path, closed path. I'm not moving with one point. I'm like seeing where my closed path has gone at all times. So at every time, whatever be the closed path, that's where I am. Yeah. So yeah, like that's a kind of loose term to put. It's just d by dt of u dot dl, and which doesn't have a unique u because wherever that, however that path is distorting, I'm going to co-distort with it. Okay, so we got Kelvin circulation theorem. Uh, I was thinking that I'll finish this whole thing very fast, but I'm not. So we're not going to have time for the logistic map. So we'll see like how to include the logistic map in the next two weeks. <clears throat> it's a nice thing for you all to know.
but it's good to finish one story also. So, we talked about turbulence where there's lots of different vortices which are concentrated tubes in which there's high rotationality and these things are pushing each other around. So, we'll just do some elementary examples of that. Okay. So, suppose I have two vortex tubes coming out like this. Okay, they're like this and they both have the same circulation gamma. Then what will happen is this vortex will give, I mean, if this vortex could be pinned here, it would make the other vortex go around in a circle. Correct? With u, with like it's u, theta would just be gamma by 2 pi r, where r is the separation between them. So if you could pin this vortex, the other guy would go around in a circle. Sometimes you can pin them like in an experiment. If you have a rotating disc which you pinned or something like that, you could do that. But then in turbulence, this guy is also not pinned. So this one will try to induce a velocity. If that one were pinned, it would make it go, down, go around. But neither of them is pinned. So what are they going to do? Hmm? Move around each other, and what were you saying? Yeah, it's basically a binary. So at any given time, this vortex is here, this vortex is here. This vortex has gamma in this direction, so it will tell it to go up. This vortex has gamma in this direction, so it will tell it to go down. With the same velocity, they'll go up and down. And what's going to happen is they're therefore going to follow a circular path. So they're going to go around in a circular path. So they'll maintain the distance between them and they'll go around. You can actually integrate their dynamics. They'll go in and, and so the line between them turns like this and turns like this. So it just keeps turning, like it just remains the diameter of that circle. So they keep going round and round and round. Okay, and... Um, So the homework here is take a big vortex. So think of that as the sun and a teeny vortex like a planet and see what they do to each other. So like take two vortices with gamma big and gamma small and plot their trajectory. So one of them should go around furiously around the other and this guy doesn't care much for that one. It'll go around a little bit like this. Like planets and sun, like, yeah, I mean, if a planet does a weird thing, the sun also will respond a little bit like that. So think of this and do what happens to two vortices like that. Okay, so this is in viscid motion where they keep going forever in a circle. What happens if there's viscosity? What will happen to each of these vortices? they'll become diffused, right? So they're going to become bigger and bigger in size, but weaker and weaker in the maximum vorticity. So they're going to become bigger and bigger. And when they become really, really big, then you can't just say that this is a point vortex and it does that. Here we were treating them as a very, very tiny point, right? We can no longer do that. Like this patch vorticity will give, like every piece of this will give a, induce velocity to every other piece. So I have to integrate it carefully. And you will see that it will no longer remain circular. It will take on like an egg shape. It will take on like an egg shape and they both will come and merge. In fact, they'll get a radial velocity inwards. And even that inward velocity is inviscid. Like what they're inducing on each other is inviscid. Each one's diffusion is viscous. And then they'll come together and they'll merge. So that's how like cyclones are born, like many baby vortices all come and merge. And it's usually 2D because of Taylor Prudman. You have more a 2D like thing, so you can get a big cycle. So this is what vortices of the same sign do. What do vortices of opposite sign do? Yes? They will merge instead of colliding. Basically, like it's 
okay, like think about it this way. All these vortex patches have the same sign of vorticity. And so like the vorticity is going to be continuous when they come close to each other. And then there's a radially inward motion. So that cannot be counted as a collision. What you'll count as a collision is if this one has a pos positive vorticity, this one has a negative vorticity, and they're coming like in incredibly fast and dashing against each other, in which case something else can happen. Some other explosive dynamics can happen. But now it's more gentle dynamics of continuous vorticity mixing. It's like I'm putting one ink drop here and one ink drop here. The ink drops will not collide, they'll just, it'll all become blue everywhere. It's that kind of, it's just diffusion that's happening. Plus the, um, plus the fact that the vortices are giving the radial velocity, which is gentle relatively. Whereas if I take two ink drops and forcibly like shoot them at each other, then they're going to dash and make many little bubbles of ink and many other explosive dynamics is going to happen. Yeah, this is primarily because of diffusion, they're becoming big. And then because they're big, the patch vorticity behaves differently from point vortex. But is it opposite? That's true. That's true. But it's going to be fairly gentle. Like the um, velocity uh, is going to be fairly small. The radial velocity may not be too small. The theta velocity, because most of vorticity is outside when, they, when these two things join. Most of the things pushing them are outside. So I'll have to do that calculation, but it will be relatively gentle. OK, so let's do two vortices, which are the same as these, but minus gamma and gamma, then what will happen? Hmm? Why do they move together in a straight path? Earlier we had one going up and the other going down. And so the line between them became turned. Now both of them are going up. Both of them are going up, so they'll just go up, up, up with a steady velocity. Okay, and if they're like this, then they'll go down, down, down with a steady velocity. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, you can actually calculate the pressure gradient. I mean, this is all pure kinematics, right? And the pressure will be like same only everywhere. It won't push, I mean, there'll be only a pressure gradient in this direction. There won't be a pressure gradient in this direction. You can actually work that out. So these things are moving downwards and uh, these are very, very long. Remember, we are thinking of them in 2D. So these are endless vortices. And uh, we don't have time in this course to talk about instabilities, but that's a very, very beautiful part of fluid mech. You'll see some very nice examples in the lab on Thursday. So in fact, this vortex sheet that I told you about, any jump in velocity, we're calling it a vortex sheet, right? Any sudden jump in velocity that automatically undergoes what's called the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. And you will see it in the lab. And uh, this, you'll see a nicer version of this instability in the lab. So what is an instability? So like if you have a pendulum, and a pendulum like this, which one is stable and which one is unstable? Stable, unstable, agreed? So, but both are in equilibrium. I mean, I've not drawn it brilliantly, but if I drawn it like strictly vertical, 
They're both in equilibrium. It's just that one is an unstable equilibrium. I touch it a little bit and it's going to fall. Whereas the other one is in a stable equilibrium. I touch it a little bit and it's going to come back. So this is exactly the same concept in fluid flow also. I'll take an entire UVW over all XYZ. And that will be, let's say, a um, steady solution of the Navier-Stokes. So it solves Navier-Stokes. Doesn't mean it's going to be stable. It's in equilibrium because it's in steady state. If I perturb it a little, I mean, I just shake the tube or I do something like that. Then I can ask, does it all come back? Does every U come back to its old place? Or do they go away to some new flow? Do they run away like as if they're running down a hill to some new flow? <clears throat> okay, and this is basically the concept of stability. In fluid mech, what you'll find is that you can give all kinds of perturbations to a flow, right? Now, any perturbation, I can Fourier transform it in space. And I can write, so like suppose I have a general perturbation like this. I can write it as a wave like this plus a wave like this, right? So I could Fourier transform it into different wavelength modes. So any perturbation I'll Fourier transform in X, Y, and Z. So I'll get a 3D like, you know, bunch of waves which I sum over. And you'll find that only a few of those wavelengths are unstable if you do the stability analysis. So you'll finally get these things will grow. Anything, any perturbation of that particular wavelength will grow, 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 and all other wavelengths will get suppressed. So like this one I'm drawing because it, these two vortices in a straight line are subject to this thing called the crow instability. I didn't plan it like this, but this whole, uh, whole set of lectures looks like it's about airplanes. <laughs> this one uh, you can see in the sky like when uh, planes leave these trailing vortices. So you can see two lines in the sky, okay? And you can actually see that they don't be, they're not happy staying this way, although it's a solution of the Navier-Stokes. You will think, oh, like they should just be coming down or they should just be going up depending on their direction. In fact, they're coming down. So they should just come down and nothing should happen, but they don't. And that's actually lucky for us and I'll tell you why. So like they start doing, they start wiggling like this. Oops, I'm nearly at four. They'll start wiggling like this. And then like they can even merge here. So they become reconnected like this. So which is actually a good place for me to stop and ask Siddhartha to show you some uh, reconnections and things. So he will take over and show you some nice vertical things. Yes. I mean, there, if I understand correctly, you said there is no rotation outside the vortex. It, it's just that, like. If I didn't say there is. So there is there is motion in a circle, but it's called irrotational because omega is zero. So, but I understood like if I just take the line integral, it would be equal to this. Like hmm. just the. Uh, component of the velocity in that circle's direction was some kind of mm. So that doesn't mean that ki maa pyaasi circle mein ja raha hai water asal. Nei, asal mein circle mein ja raha hai. So phir rotation kaise hai? Usko rotation, irrotational kaite hai because like we defined rotationality as what is the local curl of the velocity vector. That's all. It's just a use of language. Any other questions? No, it will be running faster. That's what Rajarshi was saying. Like, the mosquito problem is this, right? Mosquito problem? The assignment. Uh -huh. uh, okay, so as per the, as per the paper, the mosquito is flapping like this. But because the water is like oh, opposite kind of. Okay, okay. That's a very complicated. Like in a plane, like it just leaves two vortices in steady flow, which are like that. The mosquito doesn't do that. Like it will change the direction of its wings. 
and the way like it's upward flapping won't be the same as it's downward flapping. So it can leave a very complicated bunch of vortices or it could give one vortex which need not be a straight line. It could be a very complicated knotted structure. So we can't think about the vorticity there very easily. There was one paper, right? Perhaps nature, or I don't remember. Uh, but they were, they were like showing that there were two vortexes. I'm forgetting the terms a lot these days. So, and they it, say up the upward one is like anti clockwise, the downward will be clockwise. And that adds to the perhaps the velocity as well. Like, I'm confused, but something was happening like that. Okay, so you'll have to look at the detailed structure of those vortices and the detailed pressure diagram there to see what is the net lift. Okay. So, yeah, you can't answer that very easily for insects. Okay. It's a very complicated problem. What? I have one question. Hmm. And by the way, if like one vortex is going like this, anticlockwise here and clockwise here, a particle here, will it have lift here as well? Or no, the particle will not have lift. The particle just has a net velocity. Uh, all right. Uh, so, yeah, I'll be telling you about actually, so it's not very well planned as you'll see. Uh, so it goes, uh, luckily it has a lot of overlap with what Ramaj has ta taught you today and in the previous uh, sessions. The idea is that we'll speak about structures in flows uh, and then uh, a bit about vortex reconnections in particular. So I want to start by showing you this, uh, this should animate, yeah. Yeah. Right. So that, of course, is a, that's a movie actually from National Geographic. It shows you the big red spot of Jupiter. And that's the biggest moon of Jupiter going past this large vertical structure. And it might be around 350 years old. It's not very clear how old it is. Very high wind speeds. You have flows uh, on Earth's ocean and I mean, a very simple tabletop example of mixing milk into coffee. So do you notice anything interesting between these three things? What, what, what do you think connects them uh, up? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, just. Right. Speak up, yeah. Okay. Yeah, vertical motions. I mean, so you see a lot of the motion looks similar and it's, isn't it incredible? I mean, that's an entire moon and you have vortices that almost look like what you get in your cup of coffee. So that has actually a very strong implication. I mean, flows are self-similar. So turbulence has this property called self-similarity, which somebody they will cover the mathematical aspects of uh, next week. And this is what you basically mean uh, visually by self similarity, that you have similar patterns over different length scales. And this also actually touches upon something called universality. So, how, let's say, I mean, the, the mathematics of that is again a bit involved, and you'll see it next week. But you can imagine if you look at these vortices, you have larger ones and then smaller and then smaller ones. And it sort of seems like the ratio of these length scales is similar to what you see here. It's also similar as how you see it in your coffee cup. So, if you let's say look at the energy over all the modes, then you probably expect a similar distribution of energy between length scales. Just, this is just through a visual impression of how these patterns look. So the details are uh, something more interesting. So what do we really mean by structure when we say that there are structures in flows because you have this Navier-Stokes equation, you've, you're solving it, you get different kinds of patterns. So formalizing what structure is, is a difficult thing, but uh, in a hand-waving sense, we can say, whenever you have coherent motion of certain kinds, so you can describe it as jets or it could be a swirling motion. Swirling motion is very common and it, it's, it's uh, I mean, there is a reason why we always give this example because in turbulence, you'll always see swirling motion. And this is a very beautiful sculpture actually by Anish Kapoor, which he showed at uh, the Kochi Biennale in 2015 and it's a perpetual vortex. So it just keeps going on. And he first showed it with black water. So it looks like a black hole and you're just supposed to uh, contemplate infinity while you look at it and all that. Uh, and, uh, and he showed it in various places, the last ones in New York, so you see, it's a very small uh, thing in the whole city. But this is, a, this is a very coherent pattern. So now you've also seen that uh, you have a core which has vorticity and then there's a rotational flow around it. But of course, when you look at the surface, uh, you also see sort of gradients there. So this is what happens in turbulence. You cannot stay rotational uh, for very long. And that's, that's really a problem. Uh, before I go on to vortex reconnections, I just want to give you a glimpse of there are many, many kinds of structures you can study in turbulence and in many different contexts. 
So you can have, let's say, a jet of one fluid impinging into another fluid. Uh, so it forms these uh, axial kind of flows. Um, you can look at thermal convection. So heating of a surface that gives rise to convection. That's how, let's say, you get heating in the morning uh, 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 in a city. And it's interesting that while you have these small scale vertical structures, you also have a very large scale coherent structure there, which are these meandering uh, thermal plumes. So they have this sort of self-organization at large scales, uh, flow over channels. They give you these hairpin vortices. Um, you can have trailing jets, Kelvin Helmholtz, which Rama just talked about. And inter interestingly, if you look at these kind of convection patterns from the top, you also get these hexagonal cells that form. So if you if you are into cooking uh, and you cover your uh, pan with a lid, you'll see these hexagonal structures immediately. So these are also very universal and very diverse kind of structures. So there's a lot you can study. Uh, yeah. So that thing, the last thing that Siddharth was showing is like flow fast for flat plates. Hmm. So we talked about how it gives the Blatches equation in lamina flow. In turbulent flow, that's what it looks like. With all hairpin vortices attached to the wall. Yeah. So it's as simple as that. Like if I blow a fan on this table, it will be like if I could see the vortices, yes. I'd see that. Yeah. And I mean, going back to what Rama talked of in the first lecture, I mean, these are kind of attractor states for this problem. So every time you do this experiment, the exact realization you'll get is different where each vortex turns up. But overall, these are the patterns you'll get in a given situation. So these are the kind of solutions that your turbulent flow is uh, sort of moving past. So let's get to the vortex reconnection and vorticity path. So as, uh, as you just heard, a turbulent flow has vorticity everywhere and it uh, organizes in these tube-like structures. So this is from a simulation. And you see the a volume rendering of where all the vorticity is, and you really see this is a uh, this is a mess. Uh, so then, uh, actually, you don't see the titles, but that's all right. What's the color? Uh, the color is the vorticity magnitude. And in that? Huh. So this is again the vorticity field. So what is happening to the velocity? So if I just pick one of these structures and I make the velocity around it, then you see it has this kind of a swirling vortex uh, pattern. So it's just to give you a link between velocity and vorticity because this is just the curl of the other one. So whenever you see these kind of structures, you can expect to have these swirling motions. Um, and yeah, the mechanism for the generation is vortex stretching uh, and another thing called strain self amplification. So it turns out that strain wants to amplify itself and it also amplifies vorticity. So that's how these, these structures always, always evolve. Um, Luckily, I had a picture of the pasta bowl, which, uh, which you spoke of, uh, which is here. So this is the, this would be the turbulent pasta bowl. So now you have streamlines, not of the velocity, but of the vorticity. So now these are all the vortex jets. And you see they are organized nicely in these tubes. And this tube-like structure is also twisting. Um, and now you see that there is a crossing over here. So there is, there's an X kind of a shape here. There can be crossings here. And these are regions where these vortices can reconnect. And uh, that, that's something interesting because, okay, so you don't see the Reynolds number, this is around 20,000. So very large Reynolds number, well, uh, quite large. Um, so what happens here? Well, you would be tempted to say that I can ignore the last term, right? I mean, if you non-dimensionalize the equations and one by Reynolds number, but now you know you can't do that because there are these, these regions where the gradients are very intense. Uh, so their viscous effects will come into play uh, through the singular perturbation uh, kind of arguments. And how they manifest uh, themselves in uh, the dynamics of Navier-Stokes is through reconnections. So these would want to reconnect uh, and they will change the topology of these things. Uh, so uh, certain kind of dynamics uh, can change. So I want to show you basically that. Now, okay, I'll just go back for a second. So this is a huge mess, right? I mean, if I can extract all of this information out from a flow, but exactly tracking where uh, on presentation camera, it's pinkish. I mean, just map the colors to some color map in your mind and the story does not change. So the idea is that this is a huge mess and following the dynamics here is uh, very difficult. So how do I study reconnections if I want to do that? Uh, you want to create some kind of toy problems. So this is a very nice toy problem. It's called a trefoil knot. Huh? So you basically have this knotted vortex structure. So you see only the core of the vortex there, and that has a Gaussian profile, Lamossy vortex. So you can see already it has three places where it's crossing. So there are three regions where reconnections can happen. Um, 
And one thing I'd, I'd like to point out and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, most of the flow is invested uh, at this point uh, because there's no vorticity elsewhere. So we are starting with this initial conditions and we let Navier-Stokes equations evolve. Uh, so I've, I've rendered this in such a way that you only see the uh, vorticity. So if you don't see anything, there's not much vorticity there. So what you'll see when this starts evolving is that things will uh, align together, they will reconnect, they'll collide, and that will also generate a lot of small scales. And then you'll start seeing vorticity elsewhere. So the domain of flow, which you could have considered inviscid is reducing. I mean, most of it is going to become vortical, irrotational. irrotational, sorry. So most of it you can consider irrotational is going away. So everywhere vorticity will uh, start playing a role. So let's see how this uh, evolves. This is also a very violent event. Huh? I mean, it started with a very simple looking object. And now you have a ton of small scales that are forming. Um, so this is, in some sense, a cascading process as well, because it generates smaller and smaller scales. So let me show it to you. So I tried to zoom in and find a clear vortex reconnection. It's very hard. But there you can see uh, some of it. So you see two of these arms, they are getting together. Uh, and they combine into one. Uh, and then this, this part dissipates out. So there's a lot of uh, basically um, secondary filaments that are being formed, ternary filaments. I'll show you a video which shows that very clearly after this. Um, but this is, yeah, this is essentially the process of uh, vortex reconnection. And this is a very universal phenomena. So also if you do magnetohydrodynamics, a lot of phenomena there depends upon reconnection of magnetic lines. Uh, here you can have uh, vortex lines. Yes, so exactly. There is a similarity. So uh, before moving on to the last movie, which is very nice, uh, but not ours, is a, a note on computation. How do you do simulations for something like this, right? So first of all, uh, of course, you have to solve your Navier-Stokes equations. The general idea would be you discretize space and uh, march in time, and then you have a solution. But that's generally not good enough here. Because you see, we are generating so many small scales. So if I want to resolve the smallest scale, I need a very large grid, right, to begin with. Uh, but most of the flow is quiescent, so nothing is happening there. So you need very advanced uh, tools, which uh, like adaptive mesh refinement. So based upon a certain criteria, let's say the magnitude of vorticity, I can locally modify the number of grid cells I have. Uh, and this has to be done as many times as you're solving the navier stokes So at each uh, step in time, you need to do this. So luckily there are codes available. People have written these things like basilisk uh, and so on. And uh, you use uh, a solver like this. And to give you a sense of how much data this is, so this movie alone would be around 300 GB of data. It takes uh, three days to run on uh, say 32 processors. So these are also, these simulations can get very uh, expensive. Um, but the good thing is you can resolve uh, all of the dynamics. So I'll just end by- There's only one structure. Hmm. Imagine if you ah. want to- uh, run the cloud or something. Yeah. Today's computers can't do it. Yeah, also tomorrow's car won't be able to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so let's let's watch this. Uh, it's a three minute clip. Oh, by the way, I just want to mention uh, before I go on. So all the nice, uh, I showed you this whole host of structures that are possible. If you remember that slide. So that's taken, everything was taken from the gallery of fluid motion. It's a very beautiful website where every year people submit videos and uh, posters about fluid mechanical artwork in principle. So you need to have the science very rigorously, but also the visualizations are very aesthetically done. And it's a great source of motivation. And you can really learn a lot of different kinds of fluid mechanical problems just by looking at nice videos. So we'll do that by uh, seeing this one.
Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So we are studying that here with Somak. Yeah. So I think he's back today. So if you have, you want to discuss more about it, you can also find him or me, and we can. Yeah.